Coming up on TechZilla, Robert Herron's in the house. We've got your ACTV questions. We're going to talk about getting GPS on the iPad, the best 3D video card for under 300 bucks. There's going to be a fight, and we got a stack of your viewer questions. So heat up some oil and deep fry that Twinkie, because TechZilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by go to assistexpress.co launch and Netflix. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, and I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to Techzilla. Hands on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or the best dish at Henry's Hunan, Chicken we've got an answer. Sauce. Chicken and black bean sauce. Oh, yeah. Chicken. And if we don't, we'll track down somebody who does chicken and black bean sauce. <laughs> Sorry, it's all about the cabbage. Actually, dude, I'm all about the number one rice plate myself. Ooh. Yes. Barbecue pork for the win. Robert Heron is back <laughs> covering for Veronica Belmont while she gets her core on in Japan. Oh, Welcome nice. back, Mr. Heron. Thanks, man. Any exciting technology happening in your house? Uh, let's see. I'm, well, I am waiting <laughs> for my Seton quad tuning cable card adapter. That's the InfiniTV4. Yeah. I'm actually, I have that ordered. It should be hopefully shipping in the next week or so. Nice. I gotta go check on that, really. And I uh, finally have been waiting a month for a graphics card that wow. finally shipped today. Back ordered beyond all belief. And, uh, <laughs> I've been patient, but I got a good price on it, and it should be here tomorrow. And I'm really excited about that. So. Any new machetes or you know toys? I, or? I, I actually bought a machete recently. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that was a joke, dude. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. Did you get the Woodsman Pal? It was late at night. I bought four Blu-ray movies and a machete on Amazon. And I'm like, I, uh, don't ask me where the machete came in. Don't where that Amazon, fits into the grand scheme of things. It's the new but QVC. It's, it's at part 4 of my zombie apocalypse survival kit. I can't wait to see your Alice pack all yeah. rigged out. It's, it's getting there. It's coming along nicely. <laughs> I don't even know where to go with that statement. <laughs> From the We're Not Shocked department, Windows 7 now has more users in Vista, according to Janko Partners. Quote, browser market share and operating system market share white paper, unquote. Not the most thrilling read, but the report says Windows 7 is being adopted twice as fast as Vista was in its initial months. The report also says that Microsoft's browser share is back to 1998 levels, i.e. is at 67.73%, Firefox 17.88%, Google Desktop and Chrome 5.5%. 4% or 5.4% as normal people would say it. Mozilla at 1.36% and Safari at 0.98%. I find it like less than a percent for Safari I'll buy, but that seems a little low for Mozilla. Maybe maybe Mozilla dropped 1%. I'll I'm, to, a, I'm a Chrome user I'll through and through. That. I, 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 I was a hardcore Firefox user yeah. until recently. My buddy Grant was actually complaining because there aren't, there isn't proper like color correction in Firefox or Aww. color correction in Chrome as compared to Firefox. Oh. But, but that's uh, yeah, I, a, a browser that automatically updates itself without having to bug me about it. I'm all for that. Chrome's <laughs> the only one I'm aware of that does it. Anyway, in the Who Cares department, Apple said it sold its one millionth iPad last Friday, and that quote iPad users have already downloaded over 12 million apps from the App Store. I think Patrick is responsible for at least half those downloads. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in the very uh, that very same Friday, Apple released the highly anticipated iPad 3G. It's essentially the same iPad they came out a month ago, but with 3G data built in along with the GPS receiver. Really? GPS too? Yeah. Mm, nice. Now, while Apple has touted that the iPad 3G is unlocked, most early adapters are stuck with AT&T's offering given the unusual SIM card used by the iPad, technically any carrier can make a compatible cell card for that iPad. But it's basically like a half-size SIM card, and AT&T, of course, ordered theirs early. Props to iLounge, by the way, for taking a close look at the low-cost 250 megabyte a month, eight, megabyte a month AT&T plan. It's basically 250 megabytes a month for 15, or unlimited for like 30 bucks. It's pretty cool. And another, none of the plans actually require you to have an extended contract. So you're traveling, you can sign up for a plan. They found out it is amazing how fast you can burn through 250 megabytes. Like seven megabytes for Google Map Check, three pages on Facebook is a megabyte, and you basically a lot of people blew through it in the their 250 megabyte cap in two or three days because <laughs> the websites they are bigger than you think, and that's with AT and T's pathetic 20 megabyte cap on files sized for anything other than the iTunes trailers. Forget about big software updates or movie downloads; they're going to tell you to go find a Wi-Fi connection. 
protection. You might want to go with a $30 unlimited plan. Again, there's no contract length. You turn it off at any time, but you aren't going to run into any overage charges. Continuing with that, iLounge said that the iTunes trailer for Avatar was 40 megabytes. While the iTunes store previews look pretty good, all the reviews we've seen say just about every other avenue for video over 3G is compressed into an ugly pixelated mess. Now, the ABC app is outright blocked. The rumor has it that they need to update the app in order to get it running. Skype tells you that you need a Wi-Fi connection because of basically contract restrictions. Right. And if you were thinking about sitting in uh, basically the field watching, I don't know, YouTube or Netflix videos, Get a 3G modem and an iPad 3G. Yeah, or it, like like the 3G. Like I use a 3G modem with my iPad Wi-Fi. It works fine. The iPad 3G. If you try to watch a YouTube video, it basically looks like a Rothko painting. Really? Lots of swirly. Me- it's really compressed. But using a similar wireless setup from another provider got you better service. Basically, or? like YouTube. <laughs> is that what I'm saying? Well, it's a 3G. <laughs> it's funny, right? Because okay, so 3G in San Francisco is a nightmare. People have been going yeah. outside of uh, outside of San Francisco. A lot of people are reviewing the iLounge review is great. They actually have comparisons showing you like the the iPod. Um, or the iPad 3G playing YouTube, and it just it compresses everything down yeah. in a really bad way. Bandwidth optimized. Yeah, bandwidth optimized for no bandwidth. I was really bummed that Magellan, Navigon, and TomTom didn't release iPad-ready versions of their GPS navigation software. Copilot Live HD is out, though. It's like 30 bucks. And in more cheerful news, Engadget is reporting that it looks like there's a Steam client coming for Linux users on the heels of the OS X client for awesome. Steam. Very, very cool. Yes. Good gaming coming soon for, (laughs) what, the Mac platform and Linux? Yes. Crazy, crazy talk. (laughs) And Ubuntu dropped its latest update, 10.4, a.k.a. Lucid Linux, last week. Lucid Lucid Linux. Linux. Excuse me, Linux. (laughs) Linux on the brain. The upgrades to the free, as in beer and speech, operating system include a new social manager, music store, much faster boot-ups, and some simpler, less painful default applications. Right, so instead of like the GIMP, they have another photo editing app as a default. I, I love the GIMP. The latest version is epic. I'll, just, I'll try it again just for if you. If you've never tried Ubuntu, go ahead and download that. And Absolutely. Give it a shot on older hardware. Make it, make it feel new again. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's, it, it's boot time is ridiculously fast. Ready for a speed round? Okay. Do you guys, you guys want some HD questions? At McLean, I, these are all submitted over Twitter. Uh, take that for what it's worth. <laughs> At McLean73 asks, is HD 3D going to take off or flop? Uh, it'll flop. It'll flop. Yeah. Big it, time. It'll be, there will be some things everyone will want to see. Right. That isn't going to be the norm. Okay. I'm, I'm more along the lines of... Uh, you don't need 3D for a great movie, although you could have some fun with certain movies and content in seeing that in a 3D experience. Our, our buddy Ben over at Engadget HD raves over sports. Yeah. He says sports is the killer application for 3D HD movies. You know, it, even even Roger Ebert's back slam of 3D for movies again. I will say that the 3D experience in the movie theater will continue mm-hmm. to be a draw for a lot of people. That's going to be the highest quality venue for looking at 3D, even over what you see in the home. Right. Although the new home products are there to tempt you. They are. (laughs) Speaking of which, at Scott DM asks, how well do the 3D TVs do 2D? Are they on par with a comparable LED or LCD flat panel? They're the cream of the crop. They are the the current 3D TV models that are available today from Panasonic and Samsung are their are their top of the line models. They are the best in terms of uh, picture quality, performance, feature sets. They basically added that 3D function just to make it the, the the super premium model of that of the current time right now. So so the same or better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, eventually, you're gonna see next year everyone's premium 3D TV. Everyone's premium TV will be a 3D capable model. Right. It's just gonna be one of those check marked features. Is it? Does it have the 3D built in? <laughs> sure. You may never use it, but it'll be ready for exactly. it. At not Ash would ask, what are your favorite projectors in the five thousand to ten thousand dollar price range? Ooh, ooh. I have to say this for DLP, it would be the single chip Samsung product that has mm-hmm. Joe Kane's stamp of approval. That is the arguably the finest single chip DLP projector I've seen. Otherwise, I am. I'm thinking maybe some of the higher end. I don't think there's a three chip DLP projector for that price range anywhere. Mm-hmm. So then I would probably consider something like a three LCD projector or, oh, I take it back. I'd go right to JVC and get probably their three chip uh, DILA technology. I think it's DLA. It's a liquid crystalline silicon technology. Three chip system, 1080p projection, excellent black levels. For about 7,500 bucks, you get one of their entry level projectors. 65 to $7,500, that would make a phenomenal display. And, the, right. and uh, the, the JVC technology is the core for a lot of other third-party premium projectors, too. They actually buy the chips from JVC and use them in their own hardware. So cool. some of the ultra-premium projector designs I've seen. But those are my favorite projectors of all. I have to say the JVC stuff. If you can see it in person, 
you suddenly want to write another zero on that check. And it's like, okay, I understand. <laughs> just, just give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. <laughs> Softball question? Sure. Sierra Photog asks, what are the minimum HDTV requirements for Blu-ray? Uh, you know what? You can hook a Blu-ray player up to pretty much any TV. So right. uh, you got either have a player. component or HDMI, HDC. Yeah, I mean, you could even take the, the standard def out if you really want to pulverize that Blu-ray experience and connect that to any old TV. But I, I'm going to say component or actually yeah. no, take it back. Not even component. HDMI. I get it at this point. Yeah. yeah. HDMI with HDCP, or you're not going to get full 1080p. 1080p resolution TV mm -hmm. of some kind. Hopefully, 32 inches or larger, and that that'd be the bare minimum for the display requirement. And that way, uh, with 1080p, you can for every 1080p TV I've seen, you can do that one-to-one -one pixel mapping. So you can output 1080p right. to the TV, have it display it in a one-to-one -one pixel mode, so you get maximum detail and clarity. Uh, you can always get better performance in terms of things like contrast and pixel performance, color performance by spending more on the display. But at least a 1080p monitor, if you can do the 120 hertz or better, sure, do that as well. Because then you can, not for smoothing, right. but for frame repeating to give it that, that cinema look. He knows that I, I expect in the, the, uh, the, the, in the movie theater. Hey, <laughs> at Eden Nams, Eden Nams asks, what do you think about the new yellow pixels added to sharp televisions? I, I was, I had mixed feelings when I first heard it. I was like, why? Why do you need yellow particularly? To expand the color gamut, to give a more realistic interpretation of HD I, colors. Realistic is to be. <laughs> That's subjective. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 I actually met with Sharp last week. Uh, we had a nice little meeting here in San Francisco, and they had a couple of their brand new sets set up, and we were going over the why and the how for. I will say on their side of it, they're, they're creating a picture that's going to grab your attention in the store. Mm -hmm. that, that addition of yellow gives it an expanded color gamut beyond what we really need. I mean, it can display more colors than are available in any video signal you're going to get from any source device. But today. they're there. But if you there. need them. So if you like an extra colorful picture, <laughs> That would definitely be a set to incorporate. But beyond that, the Quatron technology, they call it for sharp TVs, it incorporates their latest panel technology, though, that I think is far more interesting. Uh, two things about it. One, they have a new crystal alignment uh, mm -hmm. function or feature when they're actually building the plant. When they put the liquid crystal material on there, they're able to control specifically the alignment of those crystals so mm -hmm. precise now that they're, they're blocking light. When they display black now, it's sealing that, that light output much better than it used to. So the oh, contrast is literally taking a significant jump up. And the aperture of the individual pixels, too, they call this collectively their Gen X panel technology. <laughs> the aperture, the size of the individual pixels has been increased. So one of the benefits of both of those combined together would be that when Sharp finally gets around to putting out their own 3D TV, mm -hmm. it may be brighter than any of the other LCD 3D TVs that are currently oh, out there. Just because you have that, that, that fourth channel, that yellow, Adding additional light to the output of the panel itself, but I'm not. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I haven't had one in the lab yet. I'm waiting. They're, they're going to send us one to get in. I want to see though. Can I color correct it to the point where it could be a perfect reference display? That's the unknown question. I, the controls are there. Will they do it? We'll find out. At WD Fleming asks, who makes the best Netflix streaming device? Like Roku, PC, PS3, HDTV, widgets. What do you like the best? So right now, Roku, PS3, or Xbox. I said the game consoles. The the the. PS3 and the 360, just because of the performance, when you're scrolling through your selections and the menu system and speed and all of that, it's a very seamless environment to be playing with that interface in. Overpowered console running the Netflix software is awesome. How about the new Blu-ray players that have Netflix built in? Those should be great. Uh, I haven't. You should get full quality because mm -hmm. it's a set-top box device and not a PC. So it's not really a quality standpoint. It's more of a convenience. If it's something you already have. You're set, no reason to buy another device, but <laughs> I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that in a TV here. And all the new 10,000, or the, some of the new 2010 TVs all have, uh, or have those internet capable features, including Netflix. So, interested in seeing one of those in, in action. We got a bunch more questions. We're going to bump those in the AC Nation. At, well, we're taping it. Wednesday. Today's Monday. This comes out Thursday. Those will be available next week. Still to come, we're going to fight over the best HD TV. No, we're going to fight over the best <laughs> graphics card upgrade for under 300 bucks, and maybe even for under 200 bucks. While well, we got your attention, though, this summer, 25 years after the introduction of .com, a new era of the internet will be born. An era where the name of your website, business, or brand will be based on what you really want and need, not just what's left over that you can buy. .co is the new web address that gives you a truly global recognition and credible option for branding your online presence. To celebrate the launch of our .co domain, our sponsor, .co Internet, is hosting an awesome pitch contest where you could win $50,000 to help you bring your big idea to life. 
So whether you have a few half-baked ideas scribbled on the back of a napkin or a full-blown business plan, head on over to www.pitch.co. Yes, that's .co, not .com, to pitch your idea in the Create Your Opportunity Contest. And you can walk away with $50,000 plus the ideal .co domain name to create your business, website, or blog. Check it out, people. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Hulu Desktop. Hulu is great. The online video service gives you the freedom to watch your favorite brand new broadcast shows and classics on your PC or Mac whenever and wherever you want to. But when it comes to watching on your big screen HDTV, Hulu's web interface doesn't cut it. Matter of fact, they've pretty much blocked it. Thankfully, Hulu was listening and produced the Hulu Desktop application. Although it's still in beta, Hulu Desktop gives you access to the same great content but in an interface more suited to a big screen lean back in the living room experience. Support for Windows Media Center and Apple remotes ensures you can access all the same content without needing a mouse or a keyboard. Select shows sorted by recently added popularity TV network, movie titles, genre profile, or just enter in a search using the on-screen keyboard. Okay, maybe you might want a keyboard then. So if you want to enjoy watching Hulu on the big screen in the living room and you want an interface that matches so you don't have to find a keyboard, check out Hulu Desktop. Viewer named Florian wrote in to say he was thinking about upgrading his two-year-old Intel Q6600 powered desktop, but decided against it since that quad-core CPU had some overclocking potential left in it. He wrote, his question is, uh, the old GeForce 8600 GPU that is in the system doesn't work well enough for new games, and I would like to play them on at least high settings. Which graphics card should I purchase for the best? Or which would be the best for gaming? And I don't want to spend more than 300 bucks. Signed, Florian. Florian says he already has three gigabytes of RAM and he's willing to add more. You would probably say get, get, go to four. I don't yeah. understand where three comes from. That's a dual channel memory system that's on that CPU and the motherboard. So you want two match sticks of right. something. That so alone can, will help boost your performance. Because those CPUs will eat all the data that the memory can throw mm -hmm. at them. So it, I think that one change, yeah. if you have one two gig stick already and one one gig stick, go find another two gig stick and then get it up to four so you have those dual channels of relatively equal memory. It doesn't have to be identical, I don't think, but as long as they're timed the same, which you can fudge with in the settings. It though. should be so cheap to buy that. Hey, by the way, holding on to that CPU motherboard combination, it's a pretty good idea. You're only going to around maybe 20% more performance if you upgrade to a Core i5, like a low-end Core i7 or a, or a Core i5. At least look at a Tom's Hardware Performance Index, which is 50% time-based scores, basically how long it takes a CPU to complete a task, like 25% games. It's really worth checking out those Tom's hardware charts because they, they basically have all the GPUs and all the CPUs. We were totally talking about that before. Now, Mr. Heron's pretty big on that your GPU and your CPU should cost around the same price. That's yeah. the classic rule. It's like a $300 CPU, $300 graphics card. Well, it's like a $200 CPU oh, now. Either way. So okay. it's just like, a, you know, don't, don't go too crazy on one end without thinking about the other, for gaming in particular. Because you need the CPU to feed the GPU, and the GPU needs to be able to process everything totally. the CPU can throw at it. Your card is definitely outdated. I would say figure around $200 for your GPU. That's what your Q6600 is selling for. It's about what the Core i5 that replaces the Q6600 is, is selling more, even though it's only got two cores. Um, I don't, you know, NVIDIA versus ATI, I just buy the I, fastest card I can get for my money. I think it's ATI, yeah. in my opinion. Right now, I'm just, I like their driver packages better, mm -hmm. and they even include a built-in overclocking tool that's something you don't get with N NVIDIA, in case you need to underclock the card for whatever <laughs> reasons, that's another story. But uh, the Pat mentioned the 4890 that sells for around 200 bucks. Really an HD 4890, that's pretty that's fast. That's a good price for, for that card. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be honest with you though. If you're gonna, depending on what resolution <laughs> you're gaming at, though, you're not you sh you're not gonna get max quality out of a game like Battlefield Bad Company 2. That's the current game where I'm finding that's one of the most challenging titles I've messed with lately. Really? That's the one that's forced me to buy a new card. I'm currently running that on an i7 system I built about a year ago with a 512 meg ATI 4870 card, and it starts to chug on medium. So <laughs> I, I don't even bother with high, and I play on low <laughs> normally just so I can get a solid frame rate when I'm playing the game multiplayer online. I'm upgrading to a one gigabyte 5870 in their 5.8 series. Uh, it's going to cost me about 420 bucks. I should have that tomorrow. I'm really hoping that arrives. I've been waiting like a month, like I mentioned earlier. Anyway, and that card, uh, the 40, uh, the 5850 mm -hmm. though, would be in the $300 range. And if you're looking for uh, an ATI solution there, and it has a gig of onboard video memory. I didn't think I would need a gigabyte of onboard video RAM until I started messing with the games that have. Increased detail within that for texture resolution right. and things like that. Games, All of a sudden, the, like the 
big, giant texture maps. And if you're going to run it, even I'm running it 1680 by 1050, and I needed a gigabyte of RAM in order to keep up if I'm going to play at any decent high setting to make it look pretty. And <laughs> so if you get like a 2560 by 1600 monitor, you need way, you... way more video card to yeah. drive that at native resolution at least. That's just, that's a lot of pixels. Yeah, and I got to say props to the graphics card, CPU charts up at Tom's Hardware. It's great. If you want to get an idea of how your current processor performs compared to what's new, it's a really great way to do it. By the way, if anybody out there is thinking about upgrading your CPU, if you have multi-threaded applications, like stuff where it basically can run across as many cores as you can throw at it, consider AMD's new 6-core Phenom 2. The X6 1090T and 1055T deliver ridiculous multi-core processing. The, the 1055T starts at 200 bucks. That's a fraction of what Intel's $1,000 Core i7-980X costs, but it's really amazing performance for the money. At least, you know, if you're, if you're doing stuff where it's like basically use a single core, meh, uh, you know, and Antec says Intel's quad-core Linfield processors, the Core i5 Series 700 and Core i7-800 are better buys. But if you have multi-threaded applications, can you say handbrake rendering machine? Yeah, <laughs> or, or multiple audio encoding with DB, DB Power Amp when I, uh, I love DB encode Power my FLAC files to, uh, like, say, AAC audio. Mm -hmm. it, it devote, it devote, uh, It'll take every chunk of every core you it, can throw it, at it. It dedicates one core per encode. So if you've got, like, eight virtual cores or whatever, suddenly there are eight encodes running at once, and it looks, it looks cool to watch. I fun. like that. So. Coming up next, we're going to talk about... Hmm, GPS know. on the iPhone and the iPad making it work and making it better. But you want to thank one of our sponsors. I do. Let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, Netflix. Netflix delivers movies directly to your home, saving you time, money, and hassle. Movies like Guy Ritchie's Sherlock Holmes, although this 2009 spin on the classic literary detective might have Sherlock Holmes purest in a tizzy, it has enough action, mystery, and snappy dialogue to keep any movie fan glued to their seat. And if you want a Sherlock Holmes adventure that's a bit more family friendly, check out Young Sherlock Holmes, a great if less than action-packed flick that should delight parents and kids alike. Both of these titles, as well as thousands of others, are but a click away on Netflix. And as a Netflix Unlimited member, you get DVDs by mail in about one business day. Plus, you can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed directly to your PC, Mac, or right to your TV via a Netflix-ready device like the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Nintendo Wii console. Watch as many movies as you want, shipping is free, and there are never any late fees or due dates. Keep the movies for as long as you like. Get unlimited movies two ways for only $8.99 a month. As a new member and Techzilla viewer, you can get a free trial membership. Go to www.netflix.com slash techzilla and sign up now. Be sure to use this URL so that they know we sent you. Looks like it's time for another Websites We Just Can't Get Enough Of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Movie Stinger. Have you ever gone to the theater to see the latest blockbuster, only to come home and find there was a bonus scene after the credits? Well, now you can prepare yourself thanks to MovieStinger.com. Next time you're on your way to see a movie, just pull up MovieStinger.com, find your movie quickly with categories like Coming Soon or In Theaters, or sift through the genres like Comedy, Drama, or Thriller. Once you open your desired category, you'll see thumbnails representing each movie and one of four comments. Extra scenes during the credits, extra after credits, no extras during or after the credits, or no information. Clicking on the thumbnail will give you more info on the movie, the extras, and sometimes you'll find out what song was playing during the credits. And that's not all. Movie Stinger also tells you what comes after the credits in video games, as well as lots of movies and video game news and reviews. Plus, Movie Stinger relies on user submissions, so if you see something listed with no information, go ahead and share what you know. So if you're seeing a flick this weekend, there's no need to stick around and stay after Nightmare on Elm Street, but if you're seeing Iron Man 2, stick around and be sure to check with MovieStinger.com each time you visit the theater to make sure you don't miss out. Patrick got a tweet from at Joseph Dawson who says, I know the iPad, the not 3G version, has no GPS. If you buy a Bluetooth GPS device, could you get it to work with the iPad? Funny you should mention that. Um, GPS with the iPhone, iPad operating system is kind of squirrely. Uh, Joseph, none of the iPhone, iPad, iPod touch devices will recognize a Bluetooth GPS device. They just didn't program in that functionality. It's pretty crazy because essentially, as near as I can tell, all GPS comms takes place over a serial port, and you emulate the serial port in devices that don't have a serial port, whether it's over USB or Bluetooth or whatever it is. Gotcha. So Bluetooth is not the answer, which is a shame since even an inexpensive Surfstar 3-powered Bluetooth GPS device from a brand you've never heard of runs unbelievably well and is more accurate than the GPS built into the iPhone 3G or 3GS. 
What you can do on the iPhone 3G, 3GS, and iPod Touch is plug them into Magellan's premium car kit, which is this critter right here. It's 130 bucks. Or TomTom's iPod car kit, iPod Touch car kit, which is 100 bucks. Or the iPhone car kit. They are vastly improved in terms of GPS reception. None of the stop and go location traffic. It's got nice, consistent, that pulsing blue. You may have never seen it if you have an iPhone 3G. There's basically a pulsing blue when it's absolutely locked on your location. Um, these devices, I have trouble here in San Francisco with uh, 3G reception, and actually, I, I, it drives me nuts. Maybe it's my iPhone 3G, but the 3G seems to have miserable GPS reception in terms of satellite reception. If I'm downtown with the tall buildings, I've had problems with almost every GPS receiver in those horrible situations, at least older the ones. New GPS. The new yeah. GPS receivers are amazing. I think mine's like um, two or three years old now. Assisted GPS or AGPS helps a little bit. Essentially, um, it actually helps the iPhone 3GS, because I think the 3GS works a lot better than the 3G in terms of the the uh, GPS functionality, essentially it, it takes advantage of the triangulating the towers to give the, the GPS kind of a heads up on where it's located and what time it is and everything. So these are just iPod docks? Yeah. I mean, basically, this is the Magellan. It's 130 bucks. Works both with the iPod Touch and the uh, iPhones. And they have a uh, dock connector on one end. Okay. They power your... You, you have to absolutely have these plugged into your lighter socket. So I'm going to do a... Uh, totally. I'm going to emulate the lighter socket here, if you could plug that in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, they, your phone or your iPod snaps right in. They've got an audio output for your stereo, and they both have uh, a speaker built in. The speaker on the Magellan's on the bottom. The speaker on the TomTom -Tom is on the back. Out of the two of them, I'd say the TomTom -Tom has the better speaker. The TomTom -Tom definitely has the better speaker. They're kind of a, a wash in terms of Bluetooth, but I found the TomTom -Tom speaker was easier to hear. Both of them have speakers because you want to be able to hear your turn-by-turn -turn directions. None of these $100 to $130 devices actually come with a mapping application. You have to pay more money to get your mapping application. <laughs> Could you take advantage of something built in, though? Like, a, say, like Google Maps or, or Bing Maps or whatever. Yeah, well, it'll help with Google Maps, right? So if you if you if you're like looking for if you know if you have like you know and you shouldn't if you're if your navigator your co-driver has is watching the cell phone, um, this will do actually a better job of keeping where you're going. But there is no turn by turn. There's no talk oh, out loud yeah, like make a right annoying. in a hundred yards. You're going to have to buy an application for that. Um, none of these devices currently work with the iPad. Whether it's a difference in the way the serial connection handshakes over the dot connector, I don't know. Nobody's <laughs> nobody's willing to talk about this. Um, I don't know if they have to be recognized differently for the iPad or if the iPad requires a different software setup or the software blocks because I, I can totally see the the, the <laughs> iPad the, the iPad Wi-Fi like being blocked for GPS and the and the uh, and the uh, 3G not, but basically because um, Navigon, Garmin, and the others all paid Apple probably a billion dollars not to do that. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? And Google's actually coming up with turn by turn directions. It's probably going to be a paid Please. software. What will turn the iPad into a 3G device or a GPS device? Excuse me, is a 3G modem like the MiFi or the Sprint Overdrive that I'm holding here. Ah. It's not quite as good. A GPS devices, those car kits I was holding up, but it works in the city and out in the highway. Um, for anybody who's like, but the, but the Wi-Fi is really good on the iPad. The Wi-Fi really sucks on the iPad if you ever leave the house. Oh, yeah, well. Occasionally, it'll give, you know, if you're in the middle of a town, it might actually give your location, but as soon as you start driving around, the, the, the Wi-Fi location is useless unless you have a Wi-Fi device that spills out GPS data, like the Sprint Overdrive, or which is basically, I did this just so I can emulate a 3G uh, iPad. And you know what? It turns out this plus this is better than the iPad 3G, except for the GPS thing. Pretty cool. I'm still puttering around with the applications. I'm mostly using the big screen on the iPad for backcountry navigation. You should check out Scenic Map and Topo Maps. If you haven't, Topo Map downloads bitmaps of standard, um, what do you call them? Uh, Little circles. I've been reading them since I was topographic a, a, maps. Yeah, so I've been reading them since I was like eleven. Uh, Scenic map actually has a full vector map of the like the one I bought is the Western United States. The oh, only nice. iPad ready car navigation app that's not you know basically car and not aviation or boating is HD Copilot. It's thirty bucks annually, I believe. Um, Tom Tom won't recognize GPS via the network on the iPad. I haven't had a chance to test Magellan. Navigon will recognize the GPS over the Wi-Fi. Um, and by the way, if you're thinking about, oh, I really want, because the idea of this being a backcountry map device is really cool, except the battery life in the overdrive sucks. You need a car connection. And I'd say the 10-hour on the battery life, the 10-hour battery life in the iPad is no substitute for a dedicated GPS device. No. This is geocaching power. for the day. It might work, but this is only two hours at best. Gotcha. And if you want to leave these on constantly, the battery life's going to go way down on this.
Yeah, it seems like you're adding some expensive accessories. Like, what is, what is, what is something like I even cost? Like an accessory to add that well, if I already had an iPhone. If you already have an iPhone, um, the Magellan's 130 bucks works with okay. both the iPhone and the iPod Touch. The iPod Touch version of the TomTom, Tom, the TomTom Tom car kit for the iPod Touch is 100 bucks. The one that has the Bluetooth functionality for the iPhone is 130. It's gonna be cheaper than a, than a dedicated GPS device. And Absolutely. Yet another device that you have to go buy. Yeah. If so. you don't have, I mean, you know, if, if you know, basically it's a mount, it's charging, it's the GPS, it's also a hands-free Bluetooth device. So if you don't have a mount yeah. already, um, the kind of combines a bunch of features. I bought this basically because I. I love the idea of using this for navigation because it's an all-in-one tool. But for my purposes, the GPS hardware on my 3G stinks. So if you're looking for something to upgrade that, this is a great way to go. Out of the two of them, I think the TomTom -Tom has the edge because the speaker sounds a lot brighter and clearer than the Magellan. Probably means you'll use it more. Yeah. In terms of GPS performance, I'd say they're a wash, but the Bluetooth performance and the speaker performance on the TomTom -Tom has the lead. Get your hands free on. Yes. Coming up next, we've got some viewer questions for you. But first, ladies and gentlemen, the best way to provide technical support is online. Why don't you try out Go to Assist Express? Both Veronica and our producer Roger use it regularly to perform long distance tech support for friends and family. Why? Because then you don't have to travel to your friends or family's house to fix stuff. Matter of fact, you can help your friends learn how to use new software or fix those family computer problems without actually being there in person. This is a good thing if you don't like to travel. Go to Assist Express also lets you easily view and control any other computer online so you can quickly resolve technical issues. Whether you're in customer support, technical consulting, or management, or just a computer guru, Go to Assist Express will help you increase revenue, reduce travel, and support time and service more clients. Do yourself a favor, try Go to Assist Express free for 30 days. To get this special offer, go to gotoassist.com slash techzilla. That's gotoassist.com slash techzilla, and you can score a free trial. Here's a question we got from Peter. He writes, I currently have two SATA connections on my motherboard, but I need to add additional drives. They need to be internal drives as I use Carbonite and it only backs up internal drive data. I've seen PCI SATA cards and I'm wondering, one, will these work? Some cards are four SATA ports internal, but does the operating system and therefore Carbonite see them as internal? Two, will this affect my power supply or cooling ventilation much? or not really as generally only one drive will be in use at a time. Signed, Peter. Well, I would think with any internal card, if you're <laughs> using a PCI or PCI Express slot, every time I've added one of those to add more drives, if I'm out of drive ports internally on the motherboard, I've had those perform just as if I were plugging it into a motherboard, as right. if it were using a chipset built on the motherboard. I don't, I don't really believe it matters. It, what are, as long is as Carbonite's that. filtered, do they know the difference between a SATA and an eSATA drive? Because they can get them like ignoring USB drives. See, I would think that eSATA should drive. be, it should appear just as an internal drive as well, because mm -hmm. usually those are hardwired from the outside into one of the eSATA ports or the SATA ports on the inside anyway. So I'm just thinking, as long as you stick stay away from the USB connected and FireWire connected drives. You should, Carbonite shouldn't have a problem. Yeah. Now, as far as power necessity and in terms of internal drives, depending on how many drives you're adding and what your PSU requirements are, uh, adding one drive I've never really had a problem with. And the adding newest four or five drives can create maybe, problems. Especially it, in startup. Yeah, it'd be, it's, yeah, it's not so much when they're running, but when they actually start spinning up the disk. A little spike in power requirements there. Yeah, if, if, if your power supply is kind of on the thin side for your, for your CPU and your GPU, you can create problems. But most of the time, the headroom from an addition, a single drive uh, is, is, is a pittance compared to the amount of heat coming off of your graphics card and your CPU. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. And if you are going to cram a bunch more hard drives in there, just make sure you have some <laughs> adequate ventilation for that. It doesn't have to be a wind tunnel going through the case, but keep the air moving around a little bit. Just keep everything nice and cool. You might want to get a bigger case, a larger case. That's the beauty, too, of adding new drives. They're, they typically will run faster in terms of uh, data trans, trans uh, write and read speeds, mm -hmm. as well as slightly reduce power consumption, too. Every generation seems to get a little bit better on Are you that. saying one terabyte, one one terabyte drive is better than four 250 megabyte drives? Almost definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Almost Nowadays. always. But I actually have a stack of 250s. I'm thinking of raiding them together just to do something fun with. But I have plenty of power on my 850 watt power supply to deal with all that. Though. You have other projects to be working <laughs> on. I've got tons of other stuff. Finally, we got a couple of responses to a couple of segments we covered in previous shows. The first one comes from Jonathan. He writes, I had a four or five year old 485 watt Intermax power supply unit. The fan had got a little noisy, but it all seemed fine. However, my PC would suddenly reboot, sometimes twice a day. But other times, once a week, I noticed the house lights dim as it happened. That's bad. So I think I'm getting brownouts like they talk about on Texilla, and I bought a small uninterrupted power supply. However, the odd reboot mm -hmm. still occurred 
and I noticed the house lights dimmed every time. Your PSU was shorting out. <laughs> I could turn the main power off at the socket and the, PSU, uh, the PC ran okay. That's when it dawned on me, it was the PC affecting the house lighting, even with an uninterrupted power supply. Jeez. I switched it off and spent a while on my laptop, choosing a new uh, uh, power supply unit, I opted for a Cooler Master 600 watt Silent Pro modular PSU. I've been running it for about two months now and all has been perfect. I have an overclocked Q6600 and Radeon 5770 and two hard drives, so I feel 600 watts is a plenty. I highly recommend this PSU for your upcoming PSU segment. Signed, Jonathan from the UK. Yeah, that's that's a bad situation where your your power supply and your C PCs is I, I causing question, the lights though, to dim. <laughs> I, I've been in apartments where that was the case. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, uh, anything it right. made the lights dim. So, but my uninterrupted power supply would would prevent that from happening with the computer at least. It depends on the design of the uninterrupted power supply because most uninterrupted power supplies they basically are a straight line from your computer through a surge protector to the mains in the wall. Really high end power supply or uninterrupted power supplies basically they take the current from the wall, they turn that into 12 volts, then they have an inverter that turns the 12 volts into 120 volts. Those are the ones that I'm using. Won't, in that, that wouldn't, like, you, you'd, you'd hurt the battery inside the PSU or maybe the inverter, but the, but the lights wouldn't go brown. But yeah, whatever, good call, Jonathan and, and Cooler Master. <laughs> they make nice stuff. Kevin sent us this email about uninterruptible power supplies. He said, I watched your show on battery backups the other day and it got my brain working. I work in a power plant of atomic proportions. We have battery backups here. However, they're a little bit bigger than your average server backup power supply. The one and a half foot by one and a half foot by two and a half foot batteries are only 2.5 volts, but when I asked our battery tech how many amps they could deliver, he gave me a somewhat disturbing answer. Quote, we can't really measure how many amps they put out. It would burn out all of our test equipment, unquote. Thought that would be enough to make Patrick drool. Wish I could include a picture, but alas, I cannot for security reasons. Kevin, that just sounds so awesome. Imagine like, it's a bank of lead acid. That's what that's got. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say it's like you get like 8D bank. or 4D batteries that are designed for, for sailboats or for oh, yeah. backing up like your, your solar panels. Or just for that storing buffer powder. for like up in Alaska. They have like a good battery <laughs> buffer system so that when the power does spike up and down due to weather or whatever, that you're able to, you know, handle that transition through the battery system without having it yeah. to rely on, you know. So the power stays consistent, really, is what they're trying to do there. So, If you do decide to use gigantic automotive or <laughs> solar or boat RV style 6D full-on Trojan golf cart cells, six-volt cells, do us a favor, put them in a box, keep them out of the living space, and make sure it's ventilated so that if there's <laughs> hydrogen gas leaks or they overheat, you don't melt a hole through the floor or blow up everybody in the house, because that would be bad. Just saying. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Thanks to Jonathan and Kevin for writing in. Hey, everybody, we're conducting a survey. We need to get some information about you. If you don't mind sharing it, we would love your feedback. If you have a few minutes to spare, please do us a favor. Take the survey at revision3.com slash survey. It's for the sales folks, mostly. For those of you who complete the survey, you'll be treated to a sneak peek of some behind-the-scenes footage of Dignation getting down in New York. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to help us out. For everybody watching, we live on your questions, so email us, Texilla at Revision3.com, check out product reviews, how to. If you ask us, we'll do it, but we need those emails, so don't be shy. Send them in to techzilla at revision3.com. Even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload to YouTube, and send us the link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Share your thoughts, ideas, and comments with other fans of the show. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Robert Heron. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. It's hard to screw up a meatball sandwich unless it's just a horrible meatball. For the best video, nah, 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 nah. sorry. Boil some oil and go poach an egg. What? You boil oil to poach an egg, Roger?
Really? What? In what? A pot? No, oil. you don't put water in oil. Oil? I've never heard of oil in a egg. You poach, an egg, you poach an egg in a frying yeah. pan with the bacon fed after you make what your bacon from your sausage. <laughs> How long have you been an American, Roger? It is. It is. Yeah. It is. I was fine now. with poaching egg. I just didn't understand where the boiling oil came boiling from. Boiling oil, yeah, dude. Actually, I lost a lot of hair on this arm barbecuing yesterday. Well, just exfoliated. Or, uh, no, just took out all the, the little hairs on my arm. Putting it over the grill. Flipping steaks okay. and Roll chickens. We got the script as well. Steaks and chickens. Just a computer. Computer. <laughs> Jeez.